All I knew was there was some Check one, two. Oh. So I tried to do it in the Check one, two. Check one, two. Check. I'm going to get started and I'll introduce Gail and then Gail will introduce you. Sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to the Iowa Files. When you could have been outside today, you're more interested in learning history, which is awesome. My name is David. I am the producer with Conjunction Media who is uh, providing the live stream and then the recorded broadcast of the presentation today. Gail always gives me a minute to kind of talk about some of the things we do at Conjunction Media. Our specialty is educational productions and corporate training. Um, and we've got a new product coming out here. It's called the Living Legacy Videos, where we would produce basically a, a documentary film about your life uh, to preserve the history of your life and, and pass it on to your family as well. So. Um, I also do some corporate training in the area of creative thinking and problem solving skills. So if you work 
for a, um, a business that has any sort of professional development needs, one thing that, I mean, I love teaching people about creative thinking and problem solving skills. I'm booking out through the summer now on that, so you're gonna wanna get in on it, but uh, I also have a couple of resources in the back. This is the book I've written about the creative thinking problem solving skills. It's called Activate Your Genius Mode. And then uh, some other resources on how to find Conjunction Media, which is our video production business. We call it Conjunction Media because in astronomy, a conjunction is when the stars align and we make the stars align for you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And now I'll introduce Gail Brubaker and get the show started. One comment was volume pushing speakers. Okay. Technology. It's fun. Hi, everybody, both here at the library and virtually. Hi, Bill. Thanks for watching again. I'm Gail Brubaker. I'm the executive director for the West Des Moines Historical Society. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. The Iowa Files is a free public education program that is brought to you through the generosity of a lot of companies and individuals, including the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Library, EMC Insurance Foundation, the Iowa Arts Council, and members and donors to the West Des Moines Historical Society. So if you enjoy these programs, please, please consider becoming a member, volunteering. We'll have a little push about that in just a bit with the lady who's knitting in the front row. But first, I am so excited to introduce Jeff Kluver for our program today. Uh, Jeff is a writer, a speaker, an educator, a historian, just all around awesome guy. He studied history at Grinnell College and earned his master's degree from Carroll University. He's a former education supervisor at Pamplin Historical Park and the National Museum of the Civil War Soldier, where he delivered hundreds of presentations tours and programs focused on the issues around slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. He has a passion for finding ways to make history real and consequential for audiences. He is also the author of Breaking the Shadows, historical fiction set right after the Civil War, and I believe he has copies of it here today. Always. Don't leave home without your copy. So, thank you so much today, Mr. Clover. All right. Well, good afternoon. It is uh, good to be with you this afternoon. It's on a lovely day. I, uh, I'm Jeff Kluver. I am on the board of directors for the Fort Des Moines Museum, which is how I uh, come before you today. We also have a, another fellow board member with us. Jack Porter is in the back there. He's there to make sure I don't say anything wrong um, and correct uh, any of the misinformation that I've got. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. It's a pleasure to share the story of Fort Des Moines with you. And actually, I, made, I called an audible this morning. Usually when I do these presentations, I tell people half the story from a timing standpoint, which is why this is a story of Fort Des Moines, Charles Hamilton, Houston. Today, I decided I'm gonna tell you the full story. I'm not gonna just tell you about Charles, but I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story that happens uh, in the uh, mid 20th century. So I think we'll have time to get through both of those and hopefully uh, the story, both stories are as interesting uh, as I can make them. So the Fort Des Moines that we were all familiar with, the one on the south side off of Army Post Road is actually the third Fort Des Moines. The very first Fort Des Moines is over on the Mississippi River uh, as part of the series of forts that the federal government builds uh, in the early 19th century to protect the Native Americans from the settlers. And we all know how well that worked. So that series of forts doesn't do its job. They build another series of forts further west. The second Fort Des Moines is at the confluence of the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers. Uh, it is the only thing at the confluence of the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers at that time. There is no city of Des Moines. There is only Fort Des Moines. That's it. That's the only thing that is there when they build it. So it's a, it's a good spot for a fort. You've got the major waterways there. Uh, there's nothing else there. You've got plenty of room. But as, as the city starts to grow up around the fort, that ends up not being a great location. It's not a great to have an army base in the middle of downtown. So in 1901, they moved to its current location on the south side of Des Moines and built, start construction in 1901, opened the fort in 1903 for what is now the current uh, day Fort Des Moines. Now, they move out uh, to the south side because there's a lot of space there. And they need a lot of space because in 1903, Fort Des Moines is a cavalry base. They are training men on horseback. So they need all the space they can get. The very first soldiers to show up at Fort Des Moines are Buffalo soldiers. They're African-American soldiers. They don't stay long, but that's, that's their first stop on their way back home. And then it's home to a number of cavalry regiments from 1903 to 1917. Now, 1917 is when we have our first major historical moment at Fort Des Moines. And this is half of the story that I'm going to tell you today. 
Because in 1917, we had become the site of the very first officer training camp for African American men in United States military history. The very first one is in Des Moines. But it's not just as easy as, oh, we're going to open up a base. There's a lot that goes into this decision. And so this is where we're going to start our story. The first question that has to be addressed before they open this officer training camp is, should we even have one? Now, African American men had been a part of the United States military for decades prior to 1917. They had um, served sort of uh, on the sidelines of the Revolutionary War in different capacities, had served officially in, during the Civil War after the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. They were able to join uh, volunteer regiments during the Civil War. About 180,000 black men will serve in the Union Army. By the end of the war, it is 10% of the total uh, Union Army are African American men. But, uh, well, then after the Civil War, they will serve as, uh, as cavalry and buffalo soldiers out on the wars on the frontier. That's where they pick up the moniker buffalo soldiers. Uh, that name is given to them by the Native Americans who both respect their fighting ability and their, thought their hair reminded them of buffaloes. And so, uh, hence the moniker. They would utilize that moniker for, for years after that. So when you hear buffalo soldiers, they're referring to African Americans. Uh, some served in the Spanish-American War. So their service has been long in the making. They have been a part of the military for a very long time, but they had never been commissioned officers. They could be non-commissioned officers, the lower ranks, the sergeants, the corporals, things like that. But they couldn't be any of the higher ranks. And so as we, as we get into uh, World War I, there are a lot of groups who are lobbying the War Department to say, this should happen. We should have commissioned officers. For, we should have black commissioned officers, still a segregated army. They should have their own leadership. This should be a thing that we do. And there are years of these debates, because remember, Europe has been embroiled in World War I for years before we get involved in it. So there's these conversations happening prior to our involvement, and they finally decide, yes, we will have one officer training camp for black men. It's an experiment. We're not really sure how this is going to go, so we'll try it with one and see what happens. The next question they have to answer is, who is going to be in charge of this camp? And the obvious answer to seemingly everyone is this guy right here, whose name is Colonel Charles Young. He is one of only three African-American commissioned officers in the Army. Now, you're probably questioning me. I thought you said that they couldn't be commissioned officers. There's one way to be a commissioned officer as a black man in the United States, to graduate from West Point. That's it. At that point, there had been three who had managed that feat. Because at that point, it's just like today, you had to get nominated by some a house rep or a senator. You, you, you couldn't just decide to sign up. They were not particularly interested in nominating African Americans at this point in time. So only three had made it through. Colonel Charles Young is one of them. He holds the right rank. He wants the job. The military says, eh, we're not sure about this. So instead, they discharge him. They say he's got high blood pressure, and they discharge him out of the Army. He gets so mad, actually, he would get on a horse in Ohio and ride that horse all the way to Washington, D.C. to prove he's perfectly fit. Uh, and they will reinstate him, but they will send him to uh, command troops in Africa. He does not command at Fort Des Moines. The man they choose instead is this guy right over here. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Charles Ballou. And Colonel Ballou, um, I, I'm not an expert on Colonel Ballou. I, from, from what I have read, he sort of has a, a mixed record when it comes to commanding African-American troops. He will basically command black soldiers for the duration of World War I. He will rise up to a, a general by the end of the war. And there are times when he supports his men. There are times when he does not support his men. Uh, and so he sort of has a, a mixed record, as frankly most people do in 1917. So they've decided, yes, we're going to have the camp. They've decided, number two, Colonel Blue is going to be in charge. The next question they have to answer is, where should we put the camp? And the first place is to say, oh, please pick us, pick us, pick us. We want to do it. Our Howard University and Hampton University, they're historically black colleges out on the East Coast. But the War Department says, no, we don't want to do that. Both of those colleges are near major metropolitan areas, DC and Hampton Roads. And they're, just, they, they're worried that the recruits will get distracted, that they'll, they'll, get, they'll get into the city, and they'll get distracted, and they won't do their duty, and they'll go, oh, well, we don't want that. They're also worried that if this experiment fails, these are near major metropolitan areas that have major newspapers, and they don't really want this exposed if this is a major failure. And so they're not really interested in that. They decide ultimately, you know what? We need to look a little further afield. And they settle on Fort Des Moines. 
And they settle on it for a few, a few different reasons. The first is that there's basically nobody here. This is a cavalry base. Most of the cavalry, not all, but most of them had been dispatched to the southwest. They were guarding the border, Pancho Villa is running around Mexico. So that's where most of the cavalry was that was supposed to be at Fort Des Moines. So they have this perfectly good base and essentially nobody here. Second reason they choose Des Moines. There's basically nobody here. The only people who read the Des Moines Register are people who live in Des Moines. So if this experiment goes badly, it's not really going to get the wide exposure. The base is, is separate from the city. Des Moines doesn't really go that far south in 1917. There's not going to be a lot of opportunity for the men to potentially get distracted, if that's a legitimate worry. But the final and perhaps most important reason they choose Fort Des Moines is because the state of Iowa wants it. The governor says, yes, we will take these men. We will have this camp. We will host it here. And that's no small thing. Most military bases then, as today, are located in the south. Fort Hood in Texas, not interested in hosting this camp. Fort Bragg in North Carolina, not interested. Fort Lee in Virginia, not interested. Another of other bases, even in the north, not interested. We just said, yes, we will take them. And so now we've answered the three big questions. Should we have it? Yes. Who's in command? Blue. Where should it be? Fort Des Moines. The next question that we have to answer is who are these recruits going to be? This is extremely easy to answer. They fill their quotas almost immediately with highly qualified men to, fill, to, to come to this camp. Um, George Woodson, who is one of these men, wrote, quote, with less than 30 days notice, so less than 30 days they fill their quota, the superb youth, the very best brain, vigor, and manhood of the race gave up comfort, position, future promise, and outlook in their various civil locations from the north, south, east, and west, started on their voluntary march to Fort Des Moines in answer to the call. God grant that their efforts and sacrifices may open a brighter and better day for all downtrodden people of the earth, and especially the oppressed colored people of the United States. Most of, I think all of the men actually, are either college students or are college graduates. These are the cream of the crop. These are highly intelligent, highly trained, very skilled men who are joining. Uh, not altogether different from officer training camp for, for white men, too. Those are typically highly uh, educated men as well. But they fill the 1,200 spots very, very quickly. One of the men who fills those spots is uh, sort of the main character of the first part of our story. His name is Charles Hamilton Houston. Charles Hamilton Houston is not from Iowa. He's from Washington, D.C., uh, and he is the grandson of former slaves uh, whose parents worked very hard to get him enrolled in what is called the M Street High School. This is the first black high school in the history of the United States. As a student, his teacher, teachers commented that Charles was, quote, persistently annoying and, quote, had a nonchalant attitude. But his academic aptitude comes to the forefront. Eventually, he earns a, a partial scholarship to Amherst. Um, he's a very dedicated student at this point. He graduates from Amherst with honors. Uh, he's one of the six valedictorians of the college. Um, and so he is highly educated, knows the importance of this uh, event, the opportunity that this could provide. And so he joins on at Fort Des Moines. He is 21 years old when he steps off the train in downtown Des Moines, uh, come to Fort, and he would write home to his parents that he joined the military because he thought, quote, he wanted to have something to say about how this country should be run, as most of the men did who joined. Now, when these men show up, there is some concern about the relationship between the citizens of Des Moines and the men who are here. The governor is welcoming, but he doesn't speak for everybody. So, what is the relationship going to be like? There's only about 5,000 African Americans in Des Moines at this time. They bring another 1,250. That's a pretty statistically significant increase. And so they hold what is called a White Sparrow event. White Sparrow events were these little fundraisers that they used to do at the turn of the century in Des Moines. And the, what they uh, ultimately do is they want to expose the citizens of Des Moines to these men, the men to the citizens, and make sure everybody is like, okay, this is going to work. This will be fine. So they bring the men to Drake University. The picture that you're seeing is Drake Stadium. This is the Southern Bowl around here. It's a Western Grandstand over there. They bring the men into the stadium. They march them around. They drill them. They sing some patriotic songs. They sing some Negro spirituals. They raise some money for the war effort. And 10,000 people show up to watch this exhibition. It's their way of trying to make sure that everyone would feel comfortable with the men. Uh, one of the, uh, the soldiers who was there wrote of the experience at the beginning of the war, a colored officer's training camp was organized at Fort Des Moines. 
1,200 of the pick of the colored race of America were stationed there. As some of them, uh, as some of these had already had misunderstandings with the town people at theaters, etc., there are some initial instances when they try and go into area businesses and the businesses deny them entry. There are some, uh, this is often where Colonel Ballou uh, does back his men. He backs his men at Fort Des Moines better than he does when he gets transferred to Kansas. Um, but he uh, says, no, 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 we're going to let these guys in. Um, they're paid in gold, which helps. Uh, that opens some doors as well. But there had been some instances uh, early in their arrival. Uh, so anyway, they had already had some misunderstandings with the town people at theaters. Many people wondered whether this aggregation was desirable. Several of us called upon their commanding officer to see if he would allow his men to participate in a sing at the stadium. He readily consented. The streetcar company transported the men into town, and as those 1,200 men marched onto the gridiron, 15,000 people, I think he's a little high, 15,000 people stood and cheered to the echo. During the afternoon, the men went through several drills, and 300 of the best singers stepped out and sang some of the famous Negro melodies. The affair closed with the ceremony of the lowering of the flag, and from that day to this, nothing but kind words are said of those splendid fellows. The singing that day with the assistance of the colored troops was unusually good, the accompaniments being played by two bands. So far as I can tell, and again, I haven't read all the sources, but so far as I can tell, the, the relationship between the men in the town was generally pretty good. There are some marked instances when, when they were denied entry into businesses, but they wouldn't have had that much connection to the town. They were training the vast majority of the time. They really only had leave on Sunday afternoons, and it wasn't easy to get into Des Moines at that point. So the relationships were uh, minimal, and for the most part were positive. Now, they show up in the spring of 1917. They will uh, be commissioned in October of 1917. Of the 1,250 men, 639 of them will draw commissions. I am not military. I've never been military. I am told that that's about what normally happens for officer training camps, if not a small, like a little bit higher percentage of people drawing commissions. I don't know that because it's not, I've never been there. But um, even we had a guy in the museum yesterday who said, actually, that's a little bit better uh, percentage than normal. They would have been uh, commissioned either captains, first lieutenants, or second lieutenants. And their first job would then have been to go to other bases to take charge of enlisted black troops. That's the whole point, to have commissioned African-American officers leading uh, non-commissioned black troops. And when they leave Fort Des Moines and they go to these different bases across the country and then are deployed overseas, they experience the, the racism that they've experienced in many other instances in their lives. And I'm gonna show you a short video clip that tells part of that story. Most of the Fort Des Moines graduates joined the 27,000 men in the 92nd Division, nicknamed the Buffaloes. They're not these, not words. Officers and soldiers were trained separately stateside under largely segregated conditions at different camps. Many whites feared being outranked by blacks and found the idea of saluting them repulsive. Most of the high ranking white officers in the 92nd Division were Southern, unsupported by black officers. Hardly a recipe for high morale. In France, they finally received weapons training, though not nearly as much as their white counterparts. The 92nd Airmen were trench lines in eastern France for patrolling and scouting duties until they were rushed to the news archive region, the site of America's huge offensive at the final stages of the war. The 93rd Division, in which a few foreign undergraduates served, had a moderately different experience. They were among the first American troops to arrive in France. They had fought with the French army, and many more French guns and used French arms. But the most decorated black unit of the war was the 369th Regiment, the so called Harlem Hellfighters, a New York National Guard unit, part of the 93rd Division. From this hard fighting, highly decorated unit, its regimental band led by James Reese Mueller. Into this year appears to a new musical art form, jazz. A few foreign born graduates served in all black units that became known as services of supply. One historian called them laborers in uniform, or the military equivalent of chain gangs, performing such tasks as building roads and the trees. Digging ditches, disposing garbage, and caring for animals. They received very little training, comparatively low pay, and poor treatment. The worst job was graves registration, 
finding, recording, and reburying the dead. This grim but important work took care of thousands of those killed in action. About one third of our labor troops were blacks, a total of about 160,000. Now, they arrive uh, in Europe, I think in July of 1918. Well, the war is over. The armistice is assigned in November of 1918. So they don't see a ton of action. There are some African-American troops who do see action on the front line. They're almost always part of the 92nd Division, the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, but they're just, the United States is not involved in the war for a, a terribly long time. Um, so their, their action, their service across, overseas is, is somewhat limited. But what I find interesting is, is what they do after the war. What, what are these 639 commissioned officers do once they come home? And this is where I want to come back to our uh, Charles Hamilton Houston character. He is one of the 639 men who gets a commission. He is a first lieutenant when he leaves Fort Des Moines. And his first appointment is to serve as, serve as a judge advocate because of his educational background. And he is charged with prosecuting a couple cases uh, where the defendant is an African-American and he's supposed to get this guy convicted. And he has no evidence. He's like, that. I can't, these guys didn't do anything wrong. There is no reason to be charging these people. There is no reason to be convicting these people. And then he gets in trouble when he doesn't get the conviction because there's no evidence. And so he would write uh, home that he made up his mind that I would never get caught again without knowing my rights. And that if luck was with me and I got through this war, I would study the law and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back, which is precisely what he does. When he gets done with the war, he comes back uh, from France and enrolls in Harvard Law School. Uh, he will be uh, serve on the editorial board of the Harvard Law Review. He'll be the first African-American to serve in that capacity. Um, he is then uh, takes a position teaching law at Howard Law School uh, in Washington, D.C. He will eventually be the dean of that law school and mentor students like Thorogood Marshall. He then becomes a legal counsel for the NAACP and begins winning some very significant civil rights cases. He, in fact, will argue eight cases before the United States Supreme Court. He will win seven of them. And he starts to put the wheels in motion for Brown versus Board of Education. He does not argue that case because he dies of a heart attack before it ever gets to the, to the Supreme Court. But you don't just go from zero to 100. You have to get some precedent setting cases before. And he is sort of setting those wheels in motion so that his mentee, Thorogood Marshall, can or argue that case when the time has come. Uh, my favorite line from Thorogood Marshall is when he's speaking of Charles Howard, that uh, Charles Hamilton Houston, rather, is that the rest of us were just holding his bags. Now, he's just, he's probably the most famous Fort Des Moines graduate, but there are a number of others that are worth pointing out. I, I mistakenly refre referenced one of them, Charles Howard. Uh, he is from Des Moines. He graduates from Drake Law School. Uh, and he tries to join the American Bar Association. They deny him that entry. And so he and several other folks that he met while at Fort Des Moines, other officers and, and a couple of other individuals, form what is called the Iowa Negro Bar Association that will eventually become the National Bar Association, which is still the African-American uh, Bar Association today. And if you're driving downtown, you can see the sculpture that they have dedicated uh, to the men who created that. A couple other individuals worth noting, James Morris is a, uh, from Atlanta originally, but he stays in Des Moines after the war. He will purchase the Iowa Bystander, which is a black newspaper in Des Moines, and will run it for the next 50 years um, and serve as the uh, head of the NAACP in Des Moines. Uh, some other folks worth noting, uh, Dr. James Wright uh, would end his career as Mr. Harlem Hospital, a uh, key doctor in Harlem. Uh, Dr. Frank Boston will receive two presidential citations for his work starting an ambulance service and um, starting a hospital in the Philadelphia area. Uh, the four kids who sit at the, the sit-in counter at Woolworths in North Carolina, their mentor at North Carolina at and is a Fort Des Moines graduate. And I think this is kind of interesting. We think of the civil rights generation as the 1950s and 1960s. It's this generation that sort of sets them up for success. And we forget their names, but we remember the ones that came after them. The ones that came after them, not possible without men like these who went through Fort Des Moines. Now, this is only one of two interesting stories that happened at Fort Des Moines after the war. It goes back to being a cavalry base. But by the time we get to World War II, the cavalry, obsolete. We don't need horses anymore. Horses, V tanks, bad. Not a good matchup. So we instead will become the first officer training camp for women in the United States military history. 
again, just like the African Americans, women have been involved with the military for a long period of time, not officially in any capacity. Um, whether it's Molly Pitcher in the Revolutionary War, the, a number of nurses during the Civil War. Um, nursing was a male profession prior to the Civil War. It's only because they have so many men who are killed and wounded in the war that they need women to start to take on that role. But even there, they're fighting a lot of discrimination. Dorothea Dix, who's the head of the nurses for the Union Army, um, she will only take you if you are older than 30, um, married, and not attractive. Uh, those were, I mean, spelled out. Those are her standards. Uh, um, Oh, I'm blanking on her name right now. The the lady who wrote Little Women. Alka, yeah. She desperately wants to be a nurse. She has to wait until she's 30 years old before the letter join because they don't want young, attractive, single women being nurses. But they they take on that role. They will take on increased roles in World War One, but they're still not officially part of the United States Army. It's not until World War II where they will create what is called the WACS, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, WAC with two A's. We'll get to the one in a minute. And they will train for the first time at Fort Des Moines. So the first officer training camp for African-Americans in military history, Fort Des Moines. First officer training camp for women in military history, Fort Des Moines. There are ultimately five WAC bases across the United States, but we are the first. The woman in charge is this lady right here. Her name is Oveda Culp Hobby, and she is remarkable. She is, so couldn't have picked anybody better. And rather than me telling her story, I'm going to play another quick two-minute video clip that sort of illustrates uh, what kind of work she does. Let's start at the top. Ovita Cole Hobby. Born in Texas in 1905, this bright lawyer worked in her state legislature. She married former Texas governor William T. Hobby and then worked at her husband's newspaper, the Houston Post. As the war began, she headed the War Department's women's interest section before the Army's top general, George Marshall picked her to command the WAC. Hobby declared that wax will be neither Amazon's rushing to battle nor fluttering butterflies. <laughs> they would be a sober, hardworking organization composed of dignified and sensible women. Her skilled leadership helped the WAC overcome indifference and hostility to achieve acceptance of this new military organization. You have just been commissioned as officers in the Women's Army Corps. I congratulate you and welcome you as the solemn threshold to service is reached. You are a part of the first corps of women, exclusive of the Army Nurse Corps, to serve with the Army of the United States. Respect your uniform. Respect all that it stands for, so that the world in turn may respect what the Corps stands for. Wherever you serve, whether here, in the field, or abroad, you are dedicated to the preservation of a free way of life until the war against the Axis is won. And we build a peace upon the unconditional surrender of our enemies. We shall pay our debt to democracy. We shall keep our date with destiny. Though stationed in Washington, Hobby visited Fort Des Moines a number of times, inspecting the facility and escorting notaries such as Eleanor Roosevelt and Ilo Wallace, wife of America's Vice President Henry A. Wallace. After the war, President Eisenhower appointed Hobby to head the Federal Security Agency and then appointed her the first secretary of the new Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. So we've decided, yes, we're going to have this officer training camp for women. We've decided Colonel Hobby's going to be in charge. The next question is, where should we put this first officer camp? And as we said, it's going to be Fort Moines because there's basically nobody here. It's been good for us so far. Cavalry, again, worthless. But this time, field artillery is what's typically stationed at Fort Des Moines because there's no more need for men on horseback. But this is a perfectly good base. It is centrally located. It is easy to get women here. And there was the successful African-American experiment several decades before. So this new experiment, why not put it here again? The next question is, who are our recruits going to be? Now, Fort Des Moines trains both enlisted and commissioned officers. We only brought 1,250 African-Americans through. There was only the one camp. Tens of thousands of women will train at Fort Des Moines, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70,000. Um, they bring them through so fast that they can't, they can't build the barracks fast enough. They are housing them in the hotels downtown. They're housing them at Drake University. 
They, they can't build the barracks quick enough to, to put them through. But initially, they have a little bit of trouble with recruitment. The first class, easy. There's a, there's a group of women that want to do it. They're in. We sign them up. But then it starts to, the recruitment starts to wane. And so they engage Gallup. The War Department engages Gallup to do some market research and some polling. And they find that the issue is twofold. Number one, you're not just recruiting the women. You're recruiting their husbands, their brothers, their uh, fathers. You're recruiting the men in their life. This is still 1942. And this, is a, this is breaking a lot of social norms. And so you have to make this okay for them to join. The second thing they realize is they have to find a way to let these women both serve in the military and still feel like women. They've never served in the military, military before. And, and so, so this, this is, is not, not a feminine, feminine occupation. occupation. We, we don't, don't see women in these roles. roles. We, we don't, don't see, see them in these jobs. jobs. Society doesn't see them in this way. So how do we make it feel okay? And this, this, this conversation happens in a million different ways, but I think the way that uh, you see it most often is in the uniforms. Endless ink is spilled about the uniforms. What should they wear? You don't wear pants in 1942. It's just not what they wore. But you can't climb the cargo net in skirts. So what do you do? If you come to Fort Des Moines and, and I'm, we can show you, like the, the, we've got so many uniforms in our collection, it's unbelievable. Different, 17 different kinds of hats and blouses and dresses and skirts and how long and how short and dress and fatigues and what kind of shoes, how high should the heel be? I mean, just over and over and over. But what they're trying to do is find a way that they can serve in these roles and still feel like women so that they can continue the recruitment effort. Now, initially, they're not supposed to be deployed overseas. That changes very quickly. Uh, they almost immediately need them overseas. The generals overseas want them overseas because they can fulfill roles. And this is the whole idea. Every single time a woman takes job X, the man who was doing that job can go have a gun put in his hand and go to the front. So they want to bring these women over to take on these roles. The Army will do a study. It's something like 608 jobs they discover in the United States military. And they decide that women can do about 400 some of them. It's not a small thing. They're not just doing administrative work. They're not just typing stuff out. They're not just secretaries. They're, there are women who, are, who fly airplanes. There are women who do um, uh, air traffic control. There are women who do uh, serve on the ships, waves. Uh, wasps are the ones who do the flying. Uh, the wax are the ones who are doing the army. The, they do any number of jobs. And they face a, a, a lot of different discrimination. There's a, a, an illustration in our museum that I think it sums it up well. There are two guys watching this uh, female officer walk by, and they're trying to decide if they should salute her and then whistle, or if they should whistle and then salute her. But th it's, just, it's just the reality of the situation. C Colonel Hobby has to go before Congress and testify that, no, they do not have high pregnancy rates. No, we are not giving them prophylactics. No, this is not a thing that is happening. It's, there are some challenges that exist. Now, just like the men, there are a number of interesting stories that come out uh, of Fort Des Moines. Again, we don't know all of them because there are 70,000 women who come, who come through here. Uh, but I'll tell you the stories of a couple as we wrap up. Does anybody recognize this lady? Her name's Edna Griffin. Edna Griffin is not from Des Moines, uh, but she is a WAC. She serves in the WACs. And she will come back to Des Moines after the war with her husband who wants to go to medical school here. She, in 1947, goes to Katz's drugstore to try and get uh, service and is denied service because of the color of her skin. She will have launched several lawsuits and she will win all of them, including the one that goes to the Supreme Court. And that, that decision by the Iowa Supreme Court effectively ends legal discrimination in the state of Iowa. Her lawyer is Charles Howard, one of those African-American officers who graduated from Fort Des Moines in 1917. So the circle is sort of complete in that way. And if you go downtown right now, you can go by the Edna Griffin building. They renamed it in her honor where the Katz's drugstore was. And then you can walk a few blocks down the street and see the sculpture dedicated to the Iowa Negro Bar Association started by Charles Howard, both tied to Fort Des Moines. Another individual that I want to talk about is this woman right here. Her name is Charity Early Adams. Uh, she is one of the graduating wax from Fort Des Moines. She is an officer at Fort Des Moines. Uh, and she is famous because she will lead the only black female battalion that is deployed overseas. And I'll show a quick video clip of her story, and then we will wrap it up. About 6,000 African-American women became wax. 
one of the most accomplished was Charity Adams Early, the Corps' first black officer. She served at the Corps for three years before commanding the first black women to serve overseas, a postal directory battalion in Europe. But, uh, Wyatt Wax had been serving overseas for almost two years by this time. But for some reason, the usual black people may make, so, may make trouble or blacks can't do what others are doing and whatnot. Uh, uh, overseas commanders did not want black women to come over. Adams answered the call from black leaders such as Mary McLeod Bethune and her friend, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt who pushed for black representation in the WAC. Both visited the fort to make sure the black soldiers were treated fairly. In her autobiography, Adams wrote that Fort Des Moines was so beautiful and well kept, one would never think of it as military. But Adams soon experienced the reality of serving in a segregated army. Her first day, a command was marked. Will all the colored girls move over on this side? Black whites usually trained in integrated classes, but lived in segregated barracks and ate at designated tables. But like other black soldiers, male and female, Adams navigated racial barriers and had a successful career in the military and later in civilian life. Her European postal battalion organized a chaotic mess and distributed tens of thousands of morale-boosting letters to homesick soldiers. She was necessary to the morale of the truth. Mayo met morale. After World War II, Fort Des Moines serves many purposes. Uh, it is housing for military families for some period of time. Um, they, uh, that we still have folks who come through the museum who remember going through our current museum building. That's where they got processed before they went to the Vietnam War. Um, but the fort has been carved up. Uh, it is no longer a very big base. There is still an active military component there. The 103rd Army Reserve is still there. Uh, but otherwise, the rest of the fort is essentially gone. There are still a few buildings left that sit on, uh, like the zoo has got some of the buildings, and you can see some of the abandoned buildings uh, off of Army Post Road. Uh, but for the most part, most of it has been transported or transferred or sold into other particular uses. The Fort Des Moines Museum and Education Center uh, sits off of Army Post Road. We consist of two buildings. The, the first you see up here on the screen, the other is the historic chapel that we, that we possess. And our mission is to preserve, uh, interpret, and promote the history of the men and women who served at the fort, both the African Americans and the women. Uh, but we also tell the story of the cavalry officers who served there as well. Uh, and for those of you who have not been to the museum, we are an entirely run volunteer organization. We do not have a single staff person or employee. Um, it's just our board of directors and other docents who keep it up and running. Um, and if you are ever interested in helping us in any way, shape, or form, we are always looking for more volunteers, whether it's to open the museum on Saturdays or help with the landscaping, if that's your thing. It's not mine, but it's some other people's. <laughs> Cleaning, um, marketing, uh, writing grants. Uh, again, we are entirely volunteer run, so we are always looking for more support. Um, we are open every Saturday as best we can be with the volunteers that we've got from 10 to 4. Uh, and we are happy to take you through the museum and show you around the collection and tell you the story. Um, but if you want to learn more about us, the best way to uh, keep up with us is on our Facebook page. And the um, second best way to keep up with us is to um, just come to the museum on Saturdays from 10 to 4. We're happy to, to host you, to have you, uh, to share more information with you. And if you want more information, uh, aside from visiting the museum, both of the videos, the, the, the excerpts that we saw today, the full videos are on YouTube. You can watch those whenever you like. Uh, you just have to search for Deeds Not Words is the name of the African-American video. And her story is the name of the uh, WAC officer video. Although I would search for her story in Fort Des Moines Museum. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of music videos that are called her story. With that, I am happy to answer any questions about the fort, about the history, or anything else that uh, I can help with. Yes. You just tooled around the roads of, of Fort Des Moines. <laughs> 
<laughs> we get a lot of people uh, who come to the fort who uh, live there post-war, post-World War II as part of the military families. We even had one woman um, who lived in that building. Um, that building was originally constructed as barracks. Um, and so there, there are like individual apartments in there basically. And so that's what it was after the war. If you come through, there are, what are there, Jack, 12 fireplaces, eight fireplaces? Oh, easily. Yeah. yeah. One, one for each uh, part of it. Yeah, so, so they could be uh, divided up into a lot of different little living spaces. Other questions? Yeah. And you mentioned blades. Were, were they trained there also? I don't think so. Uh, I'm not 100% certain of that, but I would doubt it. I, I would suspect that they would be at one of the other bases, uh, several of which were on postal locations. Yeah, I, I doubt it. Um, it's hard to trace that stuff. Um, like the National Archives has like enlistment and discharge information, but they don't really keep service records in terms of here's all the things that person did for their length of their service. And unfortunately for this particular era of history, the uh, National Archives location in St. Louis where these records were kept had a major fire a couple decades ago. So a lot of the records are gone. Um, but we get a lot of questions about, oh, can you tell me did my grandma serve here? And the answer to that is almost always no. Unless your grandmother was someone who was particularly famous or were just really lucky and happened to have a picture with her name on it, which is exceedingly rare. Uh, we just don't have a lot of that information. It's hard to get. In fact, one of the things I'm working on right now, we showed the picture of Edna Griffin. I think she served at Fort Des Moines. I can't prove it. There were only two WAC bases open when she enlisted in 1945, Fort Des Moines and another one. I've got no data to suggest that she ever set foot in the state where that other base was. But I can't with definitiveness say, yes, Edna got trained here because those records just are not around. Um, I'm working with the uh, Fort Lee in Virginia has a women's army museum. And so I asked them if they've got anything that they can help with, but it is a, it's a tough nut to crack sometimes in terms of getting that service record stuff down. How many barracks are left? Not many. Um, some of the original barracks are still left because they were purchased uh, and turned into apartment housing. So the parade ground, so if you're driving along Army Post Road and you look to the south, there's a, a partial large open field. That was the old parade ground. Um, the eastern half of that parade ground has got an old apartment complex that's been built on top of it. It's not original to the port. But then south of that parade ground, you'll see a lot of buildings. You're like, oh, that looks like a military fort. That's, those are original buildings. Those have been turned into apartments. So those are still there. Um, some of the stables have been turned into um, like maintenance sheds and stuff for the zoo. Well, but, also apartments too. Yeah, but a lot of the stuff that was built in the in the forties, which was the southern end of the base, most of that's gone. Um, it's now Blank Park Golf Course and Blank Park Field. So I would guess, and this is this, I'm just picking a number. At the end of 1946, I don't know how many buildings were there, but I would guess less than 5% of them are still standing, give or take. Somewhere in that neighborhood, I don't know, but not, not a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people will talk about uh, playing on the playground, golfing on the golf course, there's a golf course out the court, um, but none of that is, is around anymore. Well, and, and this is, it, it would be, you know, the, 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 his, the history dork in me is like, gosh, it would be amazing if somebody would have taken this and turned it into like a, a cool, unique community on the south side. The amount of foresight that that would have taken would have been like, you would have had to be a genius and have very deep pockets to think of that. Um, but we have to remember, the War Department owned a lot of bases post-World War II, and they just wanted to get rid of them. We were, we were hardly the only one. They just wanted to sell it off. They just they didn't want any of that property anymore. So they, not just Fort Des Moines, but there are a lot of military bases that just got shrunk and shrunk and shrunk or completely disappeared because the army just didn't want them. Yeah. 
on, on like uh, the service records and things like that? Yeah. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't track any of that stuff. And look up there. I mean, there's a lot of history there that I didn't know if they would have any of that. Not probably not the service records. They would they would have information on Fort Des Moines, um, but not not any of the service records. Most of the stuff that we have on the African Americans we don't own either. So all those pictures, uh, the state owns most of those. Um, we have almost nothing in our collection from the African American officers. Uh, we have a very large black collection, but the African American collection is pretty slim pickings. There were only 1,200 of them. Most of them were not from here, so they did not come back here after the war. Uh, they were they were all gone. They were all dead by the time the museum opened, and so their collections got spread to a lot of other places around uh, Fort Des Moines. So is that property owned by the state of Iowa, or was the government when it was established? The, so the 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 fort is the federal government, and so they've sold it and distributed it all off. The museum is now owned by the by the five hundred one c three by the nonprofit. Basically, the, the, the Department of Defense, we were changed names. Department of Defense um, deeded it to the Fort Des Moines Museum, and so long as we are open, it is ours. If we should ever close permanently, it would go back uh, to, the, to the Department of Defense. They don't want it. Um, as I said, they, they want to not have bases. Um, but right now, we are, we are the owners of that property. And it, we don't get any. We don't get any funding from the city, from the county, from the state, from the feds, from any of that stuff, unless we get grant funding. Um, we, we have been successful in getting some grants from uh, Polk County and things like that. But we don't get any financial support from any government entity other than through competitive grants. Saturdays from 10 to 4 is what we shoot for. And then uh, if you want to create appointments, we, we are open by appointment as well. Uh, the best way to get in touch with us is on our Facebook page, and then we can find ways to open it up and get you a tour. Especially if you've got like a group. If you've got a group that wants to meet there uh, or hold an event there, uh, we can work with you on scheduling that out. Yeah? yeah. Does the museum ever allow for any of its exhibits to travel to any public libraries, et cetera, uh, that you're aware of? We don't, we don't have any like traveling exhibits that are just established that we, we move around. Um, we have loaned certain items from time to time, uh, but we don't have anything that is easily just, you know, sort of box it up, pick it up and move it. They did in the past, way back in the day, because we've got the traveling cases in the basement, um, but we don't have anything like that established currently. Any of the interior architectural details remain in this area? Yes, um, and Jack might be able to answer this better than I because so that building has been used for so many different purposes that like if you walk in like the floor, you've got floorboards going in different directions because they've torn stuff up and they've redone it and they've torn it up and they've redone it. But some of the original architecture is probably still there. Jack, can you? Part of the stairway is original, but it's been reconfigured. A lot of the trim is all brand new. Most of the doors are all brand new. The windows and the opening and the exterior is pretty well original, but most of the interior has re, been recreated. Even the porch, there was a porch. The porch got torn off. Yeah. This this porch has been rebuilt to look like the original. Those hollows are actually fiberglass. Yeah, because we the the defense department came through and took pictures of Fort Des Moines and like the 70s, I think. You can go online and find all of those, and this building doesn't have its porch at that point in time. All right, well, with that, uh, I will close by, with three things. Uh, number one, um, again, if you're interested in volunteering or supporting the museum in any way, we are happy to work with you. If you want to come tour the museum, please let us know. We're happy to uh, book appointments if you can't make it on a Saturday. Number two, and these two are selfish, uh, I, in addition to doing these presentations, also do historical tours and other talks. Um, so if you are part of a Rotary Club, a Breakfast Club, a Book Club, um, or anything like that, I'm happy to come do presentations for your group. Uh, and if you are interested in uh, historic tours, obviously we can do tours of the fort. Uh, I also do a Civil War themed tour of Woodland Cemetery. Um, that you can book through the city of Des Moines. That link will go live here in the next couple of days. They usually sell out in about 24 hours. Um, so if you can't get on one of those, 
you can book through me. So my wife, uh, self-appointed vice president of marketing for Jeff Cleaver Enterprises, she built me a, a website. And so if, you're, if you want to just book a tour, you can go on my website and just book a tour. Um, it is jeffcleaver.com, easy to remember, hard to spell. And so I've got these little, just little slips of paper that have got it right on there. So if, you, if you're interested in that and you're not gonna remember my name because it's spelled weird, you can just uh, take one of these with you. And then the last thing I'll mention is simply, I did write a book. Uh, the book is a, a work of historical fiction. It's called Waking the Shadows. Um, it's about a 15 year old girl who's been orphaned after the Civil War uh, and she's living with her uncle. Uh, who is a veteran of the war and won't, he's so traumatized by the war, he won't tell her what happened to her father uh, post-war. So it's sort of a coming of age story. If you are interested in purchasing the book, I'm happy to sell you one and sign one. And if you want to do it for your book club, I'm happy to come talk to your book club about it. So those are my promos. With that, I'm done. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, learned a little something, and I will let you go back into the beautiful Sunday that we've got out there. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Our next Iowa Files will be on Sunday, March 20th, and it is Tombstones and Tales, Stories of Woodland and Jordan Cemetery. So we're very excited for that. So as always, it will be live streamed and here in person. And um, go visit the Fort Des Moines Museum on Saturday, then come to the Jordan House Museum on Sunday and learn more about of West Des Moines at War in one of our exhibits at the Jordan House. So it'll be a whole weekend of education. So thank you so much and have a great day.